Good morning and welcome to the Brookings Institution. My name is Frank Rose and I'm a senior fellow here in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. The title of today's event is End of an Era, the INF Treaty, New Start in the Future of Strategic Stability, a very timely subject indeed. Last month, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced that the United States would suspend its obligations under the INF Treaty and that pursuant to Article 15 of the Treaty, the United States would withdraw from the Treaty in six months. In response to that announcement, the following day, Russian President Vladimir Putin stated that Russia would also suspend its obligations under the treaty. Unless something dramatic occurs, the INF Treaty will come to an end this summer. That said, I don't want to use our event this morning to debate the pros and cons of withdrawing from the INF Treaty. There's been pr plenty of debate over the past month or two on that subject. Instead, I'd like to use our time to discuss the future of strategic arms control, trying to answer three broad questions. First, to what extent is the demise of the INF Treaty a symptom of broader challenges to the existing U.S.-Russia strategic stability framework. Second, what's the future of the New START Treaty? And third, how might we update the existing bilateral strategic arms control framework to make it more responsive to the emerging security environment? And we have a fantastic panel this morning to help us explore these issues in more detail. First, we have Michaela Dodge, who currently serves as a research fellow at the Heritage Foundation. In addition to her long career at Heritage, she has also served as a senior defense policy advisor to Senator John Kyle of Arizona. Next, we have Lynn Rustin, who currently serves as Vice President for Global Nuclear Policy at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Lynn has a long history working nuclear arms control issues on the National Security Council, where she served as Senior Director for Arms Control, the State Department, the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, and on Capitol Hill. Next, we have Prene Vadi, who currently serves as a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Prior to joining Carnegie last year, Prene held numerous positions at the State Department in both the Arms Control Bureau and the Office of Legislative Affairs. And as part of his job in legislative affairs, he was responsible for getting my, nomina my nomination as assistant secretary through the Senate. So many people will say bad things about Prene. I am not one of them. Um, and last but not least, we have Amy Wolf, who currently serves as a specialist in nuclear weapons policy with the Congressional Research Service. It's fair to say that Amy is one of the most knowledgeable people in Washington on nuclear weapons policy and programs. When I meet with new congressional staffers uh, often who are trying to get up to speed on nuclear weapons, uh, they ask me who should I have them talk to, and I always say, talk to Amy. Uh, in addition to Amy's long career with CRS, she also worked at the Pentagon uh, in 1994 on the Clinton administration's nuclear posture review. So here's how we will uh, conduct today's roundtable. Uh, first, I will ask the panelists about four or five broad questions, giving them each uh, some time to respond. And following that, uh, we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. So on that note, uh, Amy, let's start with you. And, you know, I'd like 
to begin by trying to place the INF Treaty's demise in a broader framework. As I mentioned in my introduction, there's been a lot of debate over the past couple of months on the pros and cons of the United States withdrawing from the INF Treaty. However, one of my concerns about that debate is that it has been too focused specifically on the INF Treaty and not focused enough on the larger challenges to the U.S.-Russia strategic stability framework. Given your historical perspective on arms control issues, one, do you believe that the demise of the INF Treaty is an isolated event or part of a broader decline of the current U.S.-Russia strategic stability framework? And second, do you have any thoughts about actions that the United States could take over the next couple of months to effectively manage the demise of the INF Treaty in a way that doesn't take down what remains of the U.S.-Russia strategic stability framework? So over to you. Yeah, microphone with the there we go. There you go thank you for having me here this morning um, it's easy to try to link the current state of Russian US relations to the problems we've been having with the INF treaty but that I think mixes up cause and effect the problems with the INF Treaty actually started more than 10 years ago. Russia made it quite clear in the mid-2000s, around 2006, 2007, that they saw great value in intermediate-range cruise missiles as a response to their national security concerns, that their, to their strategic stability concerns. They've gone all in on deploying uh, cruise missiles at land, on land, at sea, in the air. We're all familiar with the calibers they've been shooting into Syria. It's almost inevitable to expect that this would have come to land-based missiles as well. So Russia, responding to its view of its strategic needs, decided, according to some schools of thought, to develop a land-based cruise missile. The United States quietly started calling them out about it in the early part of this decade. So it's certainly true that the relationship between the United States and Russia in debating what's going on with the INF Treaty has hardened in the years since the United States and Russia have had other problems in their relationship, specifically starting in the 2013-2014 timeframe. But I don't believe that um, the INF Treaty is a cause of that. It's more a result of that hardening in the relationship. Now, how not to have INF disrupt the rest of the strategic relationship? There are lots of suggestions floating around in the community for subsequent measures that the United States and Russia could look at to make sure that the deployment or even the development of intermediate range cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, does not become the irritant that it was in the 1980s. And a lot of people in the arms control community and the strategic studies community talk about regional limits on intermediate range missiles or limits that would only uh, include a ban in Europe but would allow the missiles to run free in Asia. Having a long historical memory, that gives me worries because we considered that during the INF discussions and limiting the missiles to being only in Asia but not in Europe not only upset our Asian allies, but the missiles are mobile. And if during a crisis Russia were to move its missiles, or even the United States, if we stored missiles in the United States and moved them during a crisis, the movement of the missiles during a crisis could be extraordinarily destabilizing. And if you're worried about strategic stability between the mobility of the missiles and their short time of flight, uncertainty is more of a problem in my mind than the actual deployment of the missiles. So it would be important for me to see the United States and Russia recognizing what the real cause of concern would be for me. I don't know that it would be the Russians or the United States concerns. But if I were asking or looking for something that the two countries could do in the next few months or years, it would be discussions on how these deployments uh, are related to their broader security concerns and not related to their concerns with each other, if that is the case, 
and how changes in those deployments are not pointed at each other, trying to get at the instabilities caused by both mobility and short time of flight. Thanks very much, Amy. Any of the other panelists want to come in on this? Pranay? No, I think looking back to the negotiations, as uh, Amy pointed us in that direction, is important. I mean, the Russian military was against the treaty as it was designed when it was being negotiated. It was one-sided. They knew it. I think we knew it as well. Um, so I think it's important to recall after Putin arrives, uh, what, how Russia's mindset changed. This is after U.S. air power was used and demonstrated to great effect in the Balkans, in the Middle East, and Russia had this in their mindset in the mid-2000s. I mean, Putin, when he arrived at the Munich Security Conference in 2007, remarked, um, unchecked American unilateralism and NATO unilateralism um, as being a core problem for Russia, and it should be a core problem for global security. So I don't think it's that surprising that Russia embarked on a program starting with the Iskander in the mid-2000s and short-range missiles deployed in its periphery, and then obviously with the SS8, SSC-8 and the uh, INF violation to develop the system that eventually led to the demise of the INF treaty. So I think to answer Frank's original question or address Frank's original question, I, I don't think that the failure of INF or the demise of INF, the eventual termination of INF, is necessarily a thing that lends credence to Lavrov's recent statement that bilateral arms control is dead and we need to be multilateral. I think that INF had its own sort of wrinkles for Russia and, for example, New START does not because they're complying with it. They seem to appreciate what the treaty does for their own national security and, by and large, their behavior in New START has been good. Lynn, Michaela, anything you'd like to add? So I'll just add, I mean, I, I think we don't want to spend our time so much on history yep. as uh, moving forward, but I, I will say I think it's interesting that so far no one has mentioned um, the role of the U.S. withdrawal from the ABM Treaty and how that, you know, may have instigated um, the development of certain systems on the Russian side, including some of the strategic ones that are now being talked about and possibly the decision to um, go forward with uh, m these missiles that are prohibited by the INF Treaty. Um, but I think more the issue is the future and getting to your punchline, I think this just shows, I mean, we are in this, um, in this period of increasing instability and moving away from uh, regulation between uh, U.S. and Russian nuclear forces and in some quarters complacency about that, about whether that matters and whether that's, this is a, a trajectory and a trend that we need to try to avert. And so I think that's about what we're about to get into now, Great. looking forward. Thanks. Michaela? Um, I, I'd like to skip to the second part of your question, which is how, how do we manage a little bit the future? And I think to, uh, part of the key to management, the demise of the INF Treaty, is not just relationship between the United States and Russia, but it's also the relationship between the United States and its allies. And it seems to me that after you know, doing a little bit of catch up with our allies, we all got on the same page, and I think that's commendable. And sort of maintaining that unity within the alliance will be very important for just broader international security rather than just U.S. Russia relation. Great. Well, let's look at the future now. And Lynn, let, let me come to you. Um, Lynn, you led the State Department's backstopping efforts on the New START Treaty in 2009 and 2010, and as a result of that, she won the Secretary of State's Award for International Security. A little plug for Lynn there. Um, so if there's anyone who understands the treaty in Washington, it's you. Uh, therefore, I have two questions for you. The first is a softball. Uh, the second's not a softball. Um, so my first question is, should we extend the New START Treaty by five years as allowed under the terms of the treaty? And if yes, why? My second question is, opponents of extending New START argue that we shouldn't extend the treaty because it fails to capture new Russian systems like hypersonic glide vehicles and autonomous nuclear torpedoes. Do you think the critics have a valid point? And if so, how would you address those concerns? Okay. Well, it won't surprise you to know that I think we should be extending the New START treaty. Um, on the first principle that when you're in a hole, stop digging. And when I say 
and you're in a hole, as I just mentioned, I think we're on a really dangerous trajectory right now with Russia in terms of the, first of all, the, you know, the overall context of the relationship where relations between the West and Russia are understandably extremely strained as a result of a, a whole lot of uh, behavior that we, I don't need to recite here, but including Russian inter well, you starting with Ukraine and Russian interference in U.S. elections and um, responses that we've taken. And I mean, there's a whole, so, you know, we are in this downward spiral. And on top of that, we have the overlay of um, increasingly divergent views on, you know, our nuclear forces and military forces, really. And so, as, uh, as has been said, I mean, the New START Treaty really provides something very fundamental. I mean, first of all, it it's constrains the competition in nuclear forces. We're going to talk about ways in which it doesn't do that um, entirely, and that's because it's never a static situation. Um, <laughs> treaties are static, and, and military programs of countries are not static. Um, but even more important than the limits, I'd argue, are the verification and the predictability and stability that provides, which is really easy to take for granted when you have it, and uh, when you lose it, you realize how important it is. I mean, we have incredible insight into Russian uh, strategic systems and vice versa through multiple exchanges of data on the status of these forces, you know, virtually every day, intrusive 18 uh, on-site inspections a year that each side <coughs> Uh, participates in to go and confirm, you know, actual warheads deployed on systems, which is unprecedented, which we didn't have in the START Treaty. Um, and so th that uh, foundation of uh, verification and the predictability it provides as well as the limits so that we on our side can be, you know, planning against a uh, kind of a known um, environment is really important. And if we lose that it will be irreplaceable. And at first, what happens over time is, I mean, we almost take for granted how much information we have that's accumulated, you know, really going back to the SALT days and the START days and now. And over time, that information will atrophy. And I'd be willing to wager that, um, you know, probably the, the uniform military and intelligence communities are probably the stronger advocates for continuation of mutual regulation of our strategic forces. And there's a reason for that. Um, and benefits both of us. When you have that foundation in place, I mean, there's none of the problems that we have, uh, even in our strategic relationship with Russia, whether it's now the, the reintroduction of banned uh, missiles under the INF Treaty, whether it's some of these new or exotic capabilities, none of them get better if you take away New START. Some of them can be addressed through New START. Some of them could be addressed you know, in addition, there's nothing if you extend New START that keeps you from, number one, having an additional agreements or understandings. They can be legally binding. They can be transparency. They can be, um, you know, reciprocal measures. You know, nothing prevents you from doing that uh, in conjunction. Nothing prevents you from negotiating a new treaty that would supersede New START before the expiration of the additional five-year period. But it gives you this platform of... Um, stability on which to work on, and also it makes it a lot easier and quicker to do anything that you might overlay on top of it, even, you know, in a, in a dream world, even, you know, further reductions, but, you know, because you don't have to, to renegotiate all the verification provisions, which is what takes so long. Great. So, shall I, do you want me to go to the new, new systems? Yeah, or? if you, or, or why don't we actually come back to that? I know, I oh yeah, go ahead, go okay. ahead. So I just, I just want to say, so we, we first saw this. I mean, what's interesting is the original START Treaty, which I also helped negotiate, um, had, had in Article 5 prohibition on some of the types of systems um, that are, we're now seeing. It prohibited um, underwater and um, air-based strategic range nuclear systems or ballistic missiles, I think. Um, those prohibitions are not in New START, um, but what the negotiators had the foresight to put instead was a provision on new kinds, which said if either side was believed um, to be developing a new kind, which is different than a new type of strategic system, that there's a, a mechanism for discussing that in the implementing body for the treaty and talking about whether or not it would, 
you know, the treaty should apply to it. So there's a mechanism to talk about it. There's no obligation, you know, it would take mutual agreement to agree that something should be subject to the treaty, but there is a mechanism. And I'll just say one last yeah, thing, which is something like, there's some things there's no question about. So the, the new Russian um, Sarmat ICBM, which is a MIRV heavy missile, that's a new type. It's an ICBM. It clearly meets the definition of, the, of an ICBM. I couldn't believe there would be any debate that that, you know, would come under the treaty. Great. Lynn, thanks for that great overview. Michaela, let me turn to you. My guess is you have a slightly different perspective on this issue, so I'm going to kind of poke at this issue a little bit more. So why don't you uh, say a few words? Yeah, I, you know, I think there is there are good reasons to think long and hard whether we're going to extend um, New START. Um, part of the rationale for me is that over the past 10 years or, you know, since New START entered into force, I don't really see where treaty contributed to stabilization of, of Russia's behavior. So, you know, we had Ukraine, we had chemical weapons attack in the UK, we have Russia fighting on behalf of Assad in Syria and in Iran. I also think that the argument about New START not covering um, new types of Rus you know, Russia's strategic weapons is a little more nuanced than that, and that is, um, the, the sort of value and contributions of New START verification over time will decrease as those things that Russia develops outside of the treaty framework uh, became, become more important and become more prominent in Russia's um, uh, national security strategy. Now, of course, there's also issue of tactical nuclear weapons, but we've beaten that horse, I think, um, every single arms control agreement we've ever had, so I don't see that going away um, anytime soon. Um, um, right now, the question is, you know, do, do we have a partner in Russia with which we can extend New START? And I do think that the response to the question is not a slam dunk, you know, straightforward extend by five years, uh, as um, my colleague thinks. Great. Um, Amy, Prene, anything you'd like to add on this point? Um, Within the debate in the United States on all sides of the issue, there is this view, contrary to what Lynn said, that we should extend this treaty first and then try to expand it, that we should extend it on the condition that Russia agree to expand it, to include these new types of systems and even possibly to include non-strategic nuclear weapons. And that could sound like a noble cause. You know, it, wouldn't it be better if we had a treaty that covered everything rather than a treaty that only covered some things? It's worth remembering, Russia also has a list of things that it would like in a bigger treaty, and that includes limits on U.S. missile defenses, limits on U.S. precision strategic weapons, be they cruise missiles or prompt global strike, and limits on other countries' weapons, which is a reference to the U.K. and France. So none of the people who I've heard advocating for a bigger treaty as a condition of extending New, Ta New START has mentioned a willingness to talk about any of these issues that Russia is going to put on the table. So Russia is going to put these things on the table, and we know from experience over the last seven years that that's too much to put on the table. The treaty, there won't be a new treaty that incorporates all those items. So arguing that we ought to try to incorporate more of Russia's stuff in a new treaty as a condition of extending New START is basically arguing that it's better to have no limits on anything if we can't have limits on everything because it means you're willing to let New START go. And it's integrating itself into the debate over the future of New START if you listen to the voices around. And it's worth remembering that Russia will have a role in this too when they have an opinion. Do you want to say something, Lynn? I, I do. I mean, I think it's really um, important to not, and this isn't directed at you, but to sort of not have a, have a sloppy discussion about this. And what I mean is, you know, the, the beauty of the extension provision of New START is that it doesn't require, you know, advice and consent here or approval in the Russian Duma. I mean, you know, when the Senate gave its advice and consent to that treaty, it consented to the provision, which was that the executive branch and its wisdom could decide with, you know, if the Russians agreed to extend the treaty for up to five years. Um, the only 
the only things you can do in that context are things that can be agreed to with Russia in terms of encompassing any other systems. You know, would have to be agreed to as viability and effectiveness changes in the context of the treaty, which means you know you can't you can't um, bring in non-strategic nuclear weapons into the new start, start treaty. I mean, you could have a you know some kind of parallel separate agreement. You could you know there's different things you could do, but it, there's you know there's no way you can do that without actually constituting, in my view, a, an amendment. You know, on the other hand, I mean, the one thing that you could in principle do is have this discussion about strategic range nuclear systems that could become subject to the treaty um, under the new kinds provision by mutual consent, which in my view, if it's mutual, <laughs> wouldn't require a, um, yeah, you know, an amendment, but, and I don't, I don't actually preclude that that couldn't be part of a, of a discussion. But. Pranay, anything to add on your end? Yeah, I'll try to be brief. Um, I think everyone has touched on the, the sort of various questions to ask regarding new start extension, but at the risk of adding more on the uh, pro extension column. Um, I think people should. Uh, I think the U.S. government should. Pranay, can you get a little bit closer to the microphone? Sure. Sorry about that. Uh, I think the U.S. government should hit singles where it can, especially right now. So bureaucratically extending the new start treaty is a smart thing to do. I don't have a ton of confidence that whether it's NSNW, whether it's the new exotic strategic range systems, that there is a an interest in actually sitting down and having an, a wide open negotiation with the Russian Federation on these issues right now. Extension is easy for the reasons that Lynn has cited. Um, Allies, I think, have closed every statement they make about the INF Treaty, um, citing their hope that the New START Treaty will be extended. Um, for as much as uh, allies were on board with the decision to withdraw the I withdraw from the INF Treaty and suspend it, um, as Michaela pointed out, uh, none of the facts of Russia's behavior in the INF Treaty apply to their behavior within the New START Treaty. So I think that it'll be a lot more difficult and you risk diverging NATO, for example, much more than didn't with regard to the INF Treaty if you fail to extend New START or come up with some sort of replacement plan. Um, lastly, I'll touch on modernization cycles. I think as New START was being negotiated and when it was eventually ratified, Russia was in the process of fielding their new moderni modernized strategic range systems, namely ICBMs, a new SSBN, a new SLBM. Um, the United States hasn't really started uh, its strategic modernization yet. The cycles are offset, and that's natural. That's been the case since the history of nuclear weapons started. Um, that being said, it seems prudent for the United States to want to keep insights available, inspections going, data exchanges going, while Russia has a more modern strategic rocket force than the United States. Um, I think we incentivize Russia pursuing more things, whether it's outside of New START or within New START, if we don't have a framework treaty within which to discuss these issues at the BCC. Thanks, Frank. Well, Pranay, you're not off the hook yet, because um, I want to ask you a question. Now, you've done some work about the INF Treaty in China. Uh, last week at the Heritage Foundation, Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas was, according to press reports, asked a question whether the United States should extend the New START Treaty. And again, according to press reports, he responded that the United States should only extend New START if China agrees to join the treaty. Now, I think we all know that China is not going to become a party to the New START Treaty. That's just not going to happen. That said, I think many experts uh, argue that over the longer term, China will likely become the major strategic competitor to the United States. That said, uh, if that is indeed the case, the United States is going to need to find a way to bring China into a future arms control or strategic stability framework. Uh, so my questions to you are as follows. Do you agree that the United States needs to find a way to bring China into a future strategic stability framework? And if so, what are some of the practical near-term steps the United States can take to begin that process? Thanks, Frank. I, I'm glad you addressed Senator Cotton's comment, um, so I don't feel a need to spend more time on that. But 
I think that we have to start at the beginning with China. Um, we have enjoyed with Russia a certain muscle memory that has taken decades to achieve uh, as far as strategic arms control go. So I think first we have to ask ourselves uh, in the Washington community and the United States government, what are the drivers of a potential conflict with China? What could actually start a war? What would incentivize the United States to strike China and vice versa? Um, are there incentives for China to participate in arms control, if you answer those questions? Are there incentives for China to participate in arms control, and what does that arms control actually look like? I think that uh, focusing on a new start like formal treaty-based arms control agreement with China is unrealistic. Um, as I'm sure everyone in the audience knows better than I, China has a relatively small nuclear weapons stockpile um, in terms of their strategic range delivery vehicles, in terms of the warheads they could put on it. It's relatively small, and it's been that way f since the 1960s. Um, I think there are open questions in Beijing as to whether they can continue to maintain such a small strategic deterrent in the face of U.S. advances in conventional precision strike capabilities, um, U.S. advances in missile defenses. So I think that the U.S. should be looking at China in a way that we are not trying to incentivize China to sprint to parity. I think that we should be happy that China has a relatively small strategic nuclear arsenal, and then figure out ways that we can start, and this gets into the second question, Frank, figure out ways that we can kind of create stability in the kind of regional hotspots that may exist in the Asia Pacific, the, the areas in which we are more likely to become entangled, as a colleague of mine has done a lot of research in, entangled into a conflict that eventually leads to escalation to a nuclear war. Um, as far as concrete examples, I think it would be useful to approach the Chinese about any sort of military to military communications regime, any kind of in incidents at sea or avoidance of incidents in the air type agreements as a starting point. Um, ultimately, these are the types of things that should spring from a U.S.-China str strategic dialogue or strategic stability discussion, which I think have been during the Obama administration were not that fruitful, and during this current administration they haven't really taken foot. Um, other ideas like putting a nuclear risk reduction center in Beijing, um, information exchanges, database declarations, some of these things are uh, drive against the opacity with which China approaches its nuclear arsenal currently, but I think there are ways for the U.S. to find incentives to bring China to the table on these. Um, I don't think that the coercive angle that we have taken thus far with China has driven them into wanting to cooperate diplomatically, so we have to think about how we can actually achieve that. <laughs> Do any of the other panelists have anything they'd like to add? No. Nope. Okay. Well, Michaela, let's go to you. We've talked a lot about nuclear weapons this morning, but we really haven't talked about some of these new and emerging technologies like cyber, outer space, artificial intelligence. If you read the literature out there, there's a, a feeling that these new and emerging technologies are increasingly impacting strategic nuclear cal uh, calculations. Um, so my question to you is as follows. Can we have effective strategic arms control in, a in the future without taking into account these new and emerging technologies? And how would you incorporate these new technologies into future arms control agreements? Sorry. I think part of it depends on what you mean when you say effective. Um, but it seems to me that even today from our debate right on this panel, uh, there is there is this feeling that we're missing maybe a little bit something taking into how do we take into account and how do we gra grapple with these new technologies and potential new threats ahead of us and how they interfere with our traditional notions of arms control. Um, they certainly will transform framework in which we think about things like verification, about limitations, reductions. Uh, Pranay talked about muscle memory and how we have to start from scratch with China. We have to start from scratch with artificial intelligence uh, to some degree, uh, space and outer space arms control, although we have a little bit of precedence there, but we, we haven't done anything for, for a very long time. We, we don't have language developed. We don't have um, shared understanding developed with our 
partners and um, other states as far as these technologies go. Now, there is a complicating factor too that in some of these technologies, um, the United States government is lagging behind as far as um, development, uh, uh, technology development goes. So for example, in hypersonic glide weapons, many would make the case that Chinese program is much more advanced than the US program, uh, maybe Russian too. And so uh, we, it's very difficult to think about in-kind arms control when we don't really have that much to put on the table. Um, and again, that echoes the difficulty with Russia modernizing its nuclear forces uh, and the United States taking a lot longer to modernize its nuclear forces and what it potentially means for next arms control agreement, even in sort of the more traditional sense of the word. Um, there is a whole um, host of developments in the nuclear area, um, particularly, again, in Russia, uh, with new nuclear weapons outside of arms control, of traditional arms control framework. And so I, I think going forward, we basically have uh, two options. One is figure out how we can put in place link, uh, linkages between different sets of issues that Russia will care about, that China will care about, that other countries will care about, and negotiate uh, about those, even though historically speaking, it's always very difficult to make those linkages and figure out what the trade-offs are and what implications those linkages have for our future negotiations. Um, and our second option is to develop capabilities um, to sort of not match, but develop capabilities where it is in our national security interest for other reasons um, and see um, how how can we make the other party, I guess, worried enough that it will be interested in negotiations, that it will be interested in having um, transparency insights into what the United States is doing? And again, um, uh, Pranay mentioned about our interest in notifications and data declarations and verification provisions, but it cuts both ways. So as we modernize and uh, develop our nuclear forces, I imagine that uh, the Russian Federation will be very interested in having insight into what the new systems are um, and what, you know, how, how, how Russia can get more insight into what it is that the United States is doing. Great. Lynn. Yeah, I wanted to jump in and I agree with much of what Michaela said, maybe not all, to say that, so first of all, I think we all understand that arms control, of course, isn't uh, an end in, in itself. It's a tool and it's a tool toward an objective of, I think, in terms of trying to prevent the risk of, of nuclear use, of managing um, strategic competition. Um, and so I think we really, I worry a lot about the capacity of policymakers to, um, you know, un understand the implications of this rapid technological change and, you know, what it means for strategic stability, for objectives. Um, and so something like you know, we worry a lot about cyber risk to nuclear command and control. A lot's been written on that. Um, but it's a really serious concern. And of course, the threats can, you know, come, you know, between adversaries, but it also can come from third parties. And, you know, we have, we have a vested interest not only in the security of our command and control and warning systems, but we have a vested interest in, in, for instance, you know, Russia's command and control and warning systems being accurate and working as they should and, you know, not having presidents responding to potential false or mischievous, you know, warnings due to cyber interference, you know, in eight minutes. So that's one thing. Um, and I'll just say that there, you know, one thing is to have, this, this goes to the need for the a broader strategic stability co conversation with Russia. We also need it with China as well. Um, 
to really start to talk about these things. We've also got the blurring of conventional and nuclear capabilities in terms of hypersonics. What are the strategic implications of that? And there's different tools for uh, you know, addressing these things. It's not all formal arms control. There can be transparency. There can be you know, an attempt to develop you know, norms in the cyber realm, for instance, even though there's real challenges, of course, with, with verification. But some of it is having an understanding on, on what, the, what the concerns are and as well as what Michaela said in terms of, you know, there's some areas where we should have common interests and concerns and there are other areas where we have, you know, different concerns, but we need to begin to address them and, you know, find the areas of uh, overlap. Yeah, Lynn, I think that's really one of the critical points coming out of today's panel. Um, you really can't think of the nuclear issue as siloed from the space and cyber issue. I think all of these strategic capabilities issues are kind of interrelated. Indeed, last year I had to testify before the House Foreign Affairs Committee on Russian and Chinese nuclear doctrine doctrine. I spent about half the testimony talking about nuclear weapons, but the other half of the testimony was focused on things like offensive cyber capabilities and the threat to nuclear command and control, uh, outer space systems, and other emerging technologies. So that's one of, over the past several years, that's one of my focus is, is, again, we need to look at these nuclear issues in a more integrated fashion. Um, Prene and Amy, anything you'd like to add on this point? Um, I'm going to say essentially what Lynn just said, but start from a slightly different perspective. From the perspective of emerging technologies affecting strategic nuclear forces and our concept of strategic stability, I have no dispute with that. I think that it is absolutely true that the world we're coming into is very different from the one that those of us who've been doing this for a while have been working in. But I've also noticed over the last few years that every time one of these emerging technologies is discussed in a context with the nuclear arms control world, I don't understand the language people are speaking, but they reach out and say, well, we don't like this. This is scary. Other countries are doing awful things. We need to do arms control on this. And as Lynn just said, arms control is not always the solution when there's something out there that is worrisome. and can pose a threat. I mean, arms control is a solution when there's a trade space, when there's cooperation in some sense that you can have norms and agreements. But there's this sense that if we just stop the technology from developing, then we won't have to worry about that. We are not in that world now. So when you think of arms control or the either the role that these technologies play on our strategic stability and arms control discussions, or the role that arms control and strategic stability discussions can play on these systems, one has to draw a broader view of what is arms control and strategic stability. You have to think about it as more of a cooperative threat management of endeavor, finding out information, sharing concerns, the sort of thing that we started in the nuclear world 50, 60 years ago and forgot that that's the first step before you can get to the things we now consider arms control. Brene? Just briefly, um, I think we have to um, figure out what our starting point is, uh, you know, as far as the U.S. government goes. So how, what are, what are the characteristics of these technologies? How will the United States military see utility in these technologies and actually use them in a potential conflict? How would our adversaries do the same? I think, you know, when you look at something like cyber, obviously we're very secretive of a cyber capability. We may only be able to use it once before it's countered and useless to us again, and it's very hard to attribute. Now, that is very distinct from the character of weapons that have been controlled through arms control agreements in the past. And all of these different technologies have completely different attributes unrelated to cyber, unrelated to an ICBM. So I think we have to <laughs> grapple with our own U.S. government understanding of these weapons and how they fit into a potential conflict before we can go about negotiating limits on them or bans, et cetera, because none of those things may be appropriate. What may be appropriate is just getting a sense for how other countries approach using these tools themselves in a military conflict. And I think as Amy referenced, you know, and Lynn referenced, dialogue is important because, for example, we probably want to make sure that 
Russia and China don't see any utility in going after U.S. early warning assets or attack assessment assets, those types of things that may, we may interpret to be preludes to a first strike from China or Russia. To me, that, that forms the framework of some kind of joint understanding or agreement right there. Um, so it may be starting to think about the potential results of these capabilities being used um, and trying to put a limit on those activities which prevents us from falling into the place I think we all are, which is we don't really understand when a 20-year-old comes and talks to us about AI or talks to us about cyber. I don't, and I, I, I can't fit those things into a new start-like framework. But there are the end results of the use of these capabilities yep. that are worrisome and that we should look to try to limit. Great. Well, let me ask one broad question before we turn to the audience for their questions. And I'd like you to take some time and kind of draw this this out because I think it's a really really important question and it really goes to many of the issues we've discussed this morning okay putting aside who's president in 2025 um, you have been tasked by the US government to come up with a new strategic arms control strategic stability framework and my questions to you are as follows. What countries would you include in that framework? What weapon systems that our potential adversaries are deploying would you seek to limit? And here's a tough one. Where do you think the United States could accept some limitations on its own military capabilities? And finally, what happens if there's no agreement? What does that mean for the future of strategic stability? So who wants to start? <laughs> Lynn? So I may, I may not entirely answer your question. That's I mean, fine. I, I worry about, you know, where are we going to be in 2025? And I think I started out that, you know, we're on a tra trajectory on our bilateral nuclear relationship with Russia, you know, which is going like this. Um, and if, if, if we don't want to be there, and there might mean military conflict, accident, all kinds of bad things, you know, we need to actively do something to put ourselves on a, on a different trajectory. Um, and so uh, before we have the luxury of talking about some of the things you're, you've addressed, and so, you know, we really need to get back to basics in my view. We need to re-engage on mill-to-mill -mill contacts at multiple levels. We need to have more serious strategic stability. We have to empower the State Department and the interagency to have a strategic stability conversation um, with the Russians on these issues, which is more than just a polemical sort of going back and forth. I mean, we need to ask ourselves whether we think we're still in a situation that we were in the Cold War, war with the, where at the end of the day, security is mutual, that we, you know, cannot, you know, with a, with a nuclear power like Russia, you know, have sort of a um, unilateral approach to um, our security that doesn't depend on, you know, some cooperation with the other side, and that also means some measure of willingness, at, to getting to your question, to accept some self restraint because you see advantage in that because you're also restraining the other side. So I think we need to kind of get back to basics. But to dance there a little yeah. bit, yeah. I mean, I oh, still sorry. think, I know, the, I still think there's room because of the disparity in forces, there's still room for, you know, further reductions between the United States and Russia before we could bring in other powers. Mm -hmm. It's clear that that has to include a much broader conversation, which includes missile defense, includes these, you know, conventional systems with yep. strategic capabilities um, or strategic effect. And so you have to kind of have these conversations and show that you're addressing all the issues, although not necessarily on one agreement or one um, negotiation. And again, I think the forms of agreement can be extremely different. It doesn't all have to be legally binding formal arms control. Great. Pranay? Oh. Unless you want to go first. Um, no, I totally agree with everything that Lynn said. Um, I think the, the questions here are sort of 
what has happened since the end of the Cold War to arms control? Have we sort of shifted along with the rest of the world, and those of us who work in arms control with those of us who follow foreign policy more generally? I mean, we have ended essentially bipolarity a long time ago, yet we haven't taken steps, and you've seen this with the attitude Russia has had to largely the regional security architecture that underpinned things like the INF Treaty, uh, or that was composed of things like the INF Treaty, CFE, Open Skies, things that were sort of focused on Europe as a region and promoting regional stability, have largely been taken apart. Now, there are still regional stability issues that exist in Europe and are worse now as a result of that. And those same regional stability issues or similar issues are in the Asia Pacific. So I think the United States should take a look at these regional hotspots and then decide what are ways that we can use arms control as a tool to lessen tensions in those areas or at least increase transparency in such a way that some regional conflict doesn't result that eventually drags us into a strategic nuclear exchange. I think that's an important approach for now. As Lynn mentioned, I think it's important that we actually be open to diplomatic dialogue on these types of issues with both Russia and China. Um, I would say I come from the State Department, so no talking um, is too much for a diplomat. But it's important that we actually sit down and have these dialogues. Some are mature in the case of the United States and Russia. Some need to get mature quickly in the case of the United States and China. But ultimately, if we're not open to talking, we're never going to be able to figure out what what are the types of assumptions that we are making that are incorrect? What are the types of potentially inadvertent actions that can occur as a result of that of those incorrect assumptions? I think that until we have a dialogue of that nature, it's going to be really difficult to see what future arms control agreements okay. can come forward. Thanks, Brene. Amy? I'm going to rebel against the question. Um, we have been sitting here for almost an hour, and we've never defined what we mean by strategic stability. We all seem to think we all know what we're talking about, but we've never defined what we mean by strategic stability. And I'm sitting here with something next to me, which is my very favorite piece that's ever been written on this, and it's from 1985. It's called What Went Wrong with Arms Control. It's Tom Schelling. And in a couple of places in here, he defines strategic stability the way I think most people in this room probably think about it as first strike stability. If you have a survivable second strike capability, then you have stability. It doesn't matter whether you have arms control or not, but if you have secure survivable forces were identified with what came to be called strategic stability. That's what he says. Um, strategic stability is broader than that. And I, before I actually answer the question or try to, I want to go back to something Lynn said earlier. Lynn mentioned the relationship between the demise of the ABM Treaty in 2002 and the new Russian strategic systems that we've been worried about since last year. That is a classic ca case of instability, strategic instability. Putin told us when he revealed those weapons that they were a response to something that happened 15 years old, earlier, the US withdrawal from the ABM Treaty. At that time, Russia looked forward and said, Oh my God, the United States is going to deploy broad-scale missile defenses, and we need to develop technologies that can go under, around, and through those defenses, whether it's an intercontinental cruise missile, an underwater drone. We, if they had asked us, and actually they did, and we answered, oh, our defenses aren't going to be aimed at you. They didn't believe us. So there was an instability in their strategic environment in 2002 that they responded to the Weapons appeared in 2017, 2018, and now we feel an instability because they can shoot those weapons at us and we have no defenses against them. So strategic stability has a much longer timeline to it if you don't think about it as crisis stability. So if you're asking me in 2019 what I think we should do in 2026, I want to see that as a long view. I want to think about it as not which weapons do I want to limit. I don't have particular concerns with hypersonic glide vehicles, particularly if they're nuclear armed and on Russian ballistic missiles, because those are similar to, they're just maneuvering warheads on the existing missiles that we have, and we have nuclear deterrence to respond to that. But I have concerns that we don't know what it is w in 2019, what we will be concerned about in 2026. We don't know what the Russians will be concerned about in 2026. We don't know what the Chinese will be concerned about or what our allies will be concerned about. Strategic instability exists when one of the players in this game has a concern about something they see coming down the pike in the long term, and they react now to it. And we don't know what that space looks like because it's the future. So what I would do either in 2026 or between now and 2026, the first thing I would do is I wouldn't call it arms control. 
arms control evokes an image. It's an image of legally binding treaties that require limits or reductions in offensive nuclear weapons. And you've already heard from everyone on the panel, there's much more to arms control than just legally binding treaties. But when you're talking to people who haven't spent years in the field, they do. And I'm sure many people in the room know people who feel this way. Arms control means we need treaties, and we don't. So I would stop calling it arms control, and I also would stop calling it strategic stability because, as I said, we all have different definitions of strategic stability. So what I would do is I would recognize that the instabilities we'll be dealing with in 2026 are coming down the pike now. We don't know what they'd be. So we want to think about the process of talking to our adversaries, talking to our allies, talking to the different components of our government now about the things that worry us. Is it cyber? Is it AI? Is it hypersonics? What do we think will make us feel like we need a military response in 2026? So the first thing would be to stop calling it arms control, stop referring to it strategic stability, and maybe focus on a package of measures, proposals, unilateral steps that are more focused and specific to addressing emerging concerns, which of course means we have to start by defining those emerging concerns. And this could be within the nuclear weapons world or across domains, but until we define what those emerging concerns are and talk to the other countries that are also defining their emerging concerns, we can't define strategic stability or develop measures to affect stability. Thanks very much. And let me also say that article by Tom Schelling from 1985 is excellent. One of the other issues he gets into in the article is the, the tension between the character of weapons and numbers of weapons, which is, a, I think, a very, very useful discussion to have now. Michaela, anything you'd like to add before we turn it over to the audience? So I think that the U.S. government has taken a useful step in terms of what future looks like, what future worries look like with the national defense strategy. Uh, and I think looking at how we implement that strategy going forward and how we work in an environment of a great power competition with Russia and China will be one of the um, important principles um, for whatever happens in 2026. I do agree that we have to get more creative than just kind of good old arms control. Uh, there is different shades of, what should we call it next? Twitter context, what should we call next arms control? Um, there are different options that we have. I also think, uh, and one of the kind of underappreciated roles of the United States uh, that will continue to assume importance in the future is that of, me, um, of a partner who can mediate um, potential conflicts between two states who have nuclear weapons and don't like each other. So U.S. influence in um, conflicts between India and Pakistan and making sure that those conflicts will not go nuclear. Um, I think that aspect will continue to be important in the future because countries will not give up nuclear weapons anytime soon. And so nurturing those relationships, nurturing um, uh, those elements of uh, our government that pursue and build those relationships uh, will also be very important. Great, thanks. So let's move to questions from the audience. Uh, I ask a couple of things. One, there is a microphone coming around. Uh, two, that you identify yourselves and ask a question. So why don't we start back there uh, with Bob Einhorn, and let's take three at a time. So Bob. Frank, thank you very much. Excellent panel, thank you uh, all. So uh, I asked the panelists, and, and you too, Frank, if you're considered a panelist, um, uh, what they think about the following approach. Uh, so the United States and Russia agree to extend New START, and at the same time, uh, they issue a high-level joint statement uh, saying they will enter into uh, consultations, high-level consultations, not negotiations, consultations on the implications for strategic stability and arms control of the following, non-strategic nuclear weapons, uh, conventional systems with strategic implications, 
emerging technologies with strategic implications, uh, third party capabilities, and what else? New kinds of strategic offensive forces. In other words, this is a kind of directed uh, schmooze, strategic schmooze, a uh, strategic stability talks with an agenda. It's, uh, it avoids Amy's problem uh, of making New START extension conditional upon agreement to limit certain kinds of systems. It's a consultation. It's the beginning of strategic stability talks. It's a, it's a political commitment to enter into such talks. Okay. Next question. Right up the right, right there. Right there. Yes, yeah. right up here. Uh, yes, my name is Roger Cochetti. I work with private equity in the technology sector. And there was little mentioned in the panel of w one of the underlying issues I think deserves more attention, and that is the impact of the decline of arms control, the, the ABM and, and INF and yeah. probably START, on nonproliferation yeah. and the NPT review. So could, the, could anyone in the panel talk about the consequences for nonproliferation of... Uh, and let's take bill? one more. Right here, right up front. Uh, my name is my name is Sang Min. I'm a reporter from the Radio Free Asia. I want to know if there is any relations or replication between the end of NF Treaty and uh, North Korea nuclear and the missile issue. If there is, can you tell me what implication or relations that have will be for the end of the INF Treaty for the North Korea nuclear issue? Great. Who wants to start? Lynn. Um, I'll start. Um, so, you know, Bob, I think your uh, formulation is great. I'm sure when it's being negotiated with the Russians, they would add in missile defense to your list. <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, and that's the rejoinder. Um, and uh, it, it could all be topped off with a, with a Reagan-esque, Reagan uh, Gorbachev-esque statement reaffirming that nuclear war can't be won and shouldn't be fought. And, you know, my sense is we came um, close to doing some, you know, that there was, there was discussion of this kind of thing at the Helsinki summit. And, um, you know, sadly, there was no, well, everyone knows how that went awry afterwards in the press conference and, you know, very little follow through. So the question is, do, you know, is there the will and the, frankly, the capacity to undertake the kind of serious strategic stability talks um, that you outline? But that's exact, to me, that's exactly the right direction and the, your point that it needs to come from the leaders. It needs to come from the presidents, the demand signal to their governments. Um, that we should get serious about, you know, talking about these issues and the, the extension of New START is, you know, the signal that we're not interested in a kind of uncontained competition, that we want to continue to have some um, guardrails on our strategic competition and to kind of understand that we have a stake in each other's security in a way. Um, if we're really entering great power competition, then you need more than just a military tool, if it's available, to try to um, um, mitigate the threats that you see from another country. Um, your point about the gentleman who raised the MPT, absolutely, I'm, I'm remiss in not mentioning that or nonproliferation in general, but I think people underestimate, uh, who maybe aren't watching closely, the um, disillusionment of the international community and the non-nuclear weapon states with what they see as an increasing um, failure of the nuclear weapon states to live up to their commitment to continue a disarmament process. And we are indeed headed toward a very rough 2020 uh, 50th anniversary review, is it right, 50th? MPT review conference, um, where if we can't at a minimum come into that conference saying that the U.S. and Russia have agreed to extend New START, um, we are going to be in really bad shape. Um, I'll leave it at that. Amy. Um, on the 
agenda for strategic stability talks, there's no question it would be really nice to have, as Lynn said, political leadership on establishing an agenda and sitting down and actually having the talks. But the list is long, and the Russians have their own list, and to get agreement within the U.S. government to have a talks on a list that includes some of the Russian priorities would be difficult, no matter who is president and what is in the majority in Congress. U.S. policy right now, as enunciated in both the Missile Defense Review and in the President's statement during the rollout, is the United States will never, under any circumstances, consider any limits on missile defense, while Russia won't hold any talks that don't contain the possibility of discussing limits on missile defense. We would like to talk to the Russians about limits on non-strategic nuclear weapons. No question that's been a goal across administrations and across partisan divide. And the last time we had Track 1.5 and Track 2 discussions with the Russians about non-strategic nuclear weapons in the 2010-2012 timeframe, they made it clear they would not go forward with talks on their weapons until we pulled all our weapons out of Europe, something we're not willing to talk about now. So even though the agenda makes logical sense, and as Lynn said, with presidential directive, we could have that agenda. It still has to work its way through the political system in both the United States and in Russia. And so good ideas are great until you try and get everybody else to agree to that. On the NPT review conference issue, as Lynn said, the international community in many quarters is extraordinarily distressed about U.S. and Russian reductions about the supposed commitment to Article 6. There is a rejoinder to that from those who would argue that even if the United States and Russia were walking into every review conference with further reductions in their nuclear weapons, the international community would still be slapping at us about this, and that's probably true. So even though going into the review conference with New START extended may not buy us much. I'd agree with Lynn, going in without it will cost us. On the question of INF and North Korea, I think you can probably handle the Asia side of this better, but when the withdrawal from INF was announced, there was this secondary line about, and oh, by the way, we can now respond to China's INF missiles. <laughs> If you listen to, read, talk to the people who focus on Asia and focus on threats in Asia, having U.S. land-based missiles available to address the North Korean threat is on their list of things they'd like to have. But there's lots of things on the list of things people would like to have. So I'm not sure, and I really doubt there's a direct connection that anyone would say, oh, we need to get out of INF so we can deploy missiles that we can use in a Korea contingency. But once we're out of INF, people will find a use for missiles in the Korea contingency. Brene. Uh, um, to Bob's point, I, I think that's a great framework. I think making the, the precondition, if that's what we want to call it, as soft a precondition as possible to extension is important. Um, I think more importantly, and for all the reasons that Amy and Lynn cited you know, bureaucratically, uh, the only way I see a New START extension decision being reached by this administration is if you can somehow Trumpify the New START treaty. If that means c connecting it to a a this administration's strategic stabi stability dialogue with Russia, that's great. If it means something else on the margins, like additional declarations or transparency into NSNW, that's great as well. <clears throat> I just find it hard to believe the administration would just be able to quietly extend the New START Treaty in its current form without at least having some kind of window dressing on it. Um, as far as the review conference goes, um, I agree with the previous comments. I think the only thing I'll add as far as uh, sort of the ban treaty supporters versus those who are opposed to it, um, people should recall the stress that a bad review conference can place on NATO, um, especially basing countries for U.S. nuclear weapons. Um, the potential for a post-INF and post-New START world free of all constraints for countries that really <laughs> still hold on for dear life to arms control, whether it's due to symbolism or regional security and stability questions in Europe, um, walking out of the review conference with no consensus, empty-handed, no new start extension, I personally wonder whether basing countries will see enough uproar from their dom domestic populations that they really call into question nuclear sharing arrangements. Michaela. Um, you know, I think there will be 
I think there will be upper uh, on the part of the basic countries almost no matter what, um, just because the mood in Europe uh, has long term been sort of against tactical nuclear weapons uh, on their soil. Um, now, I, I, I will take the North Korea question partly because I'm not there on New START extension and I don't think that it should be extended. And I think it will be very, very difficult to come to any sort of agreement with Russia as it is today on US missile defenses or Russia's missile defense or um, new kinds of nuclear weapons that Russia has but the United States doesn't. Um, not, not to say that we should be doing these things just because of Russia, we should be doing them if we have good strategic rationale for us and our security interest. Um, I, I think many people are trying to portray the INF Treaty withdrawal as uh, something that the United States did to counter China. Um, but I think there is very easy counter argument to it, which is if Russia wasn't violating the INF Treaty, the United States would still be bound by the treaty today. Um, it, you know, it doesn't get to the North Korea per se because I'm not familiar with U.S. military planning on the Korean Peninsula, but I would like to submit that if Russia did not violate the INF Treaty, we'd still have INF Treaty, even though some find utility of the INF range missiles in China scenarios. And we know there are some problems with that, but I'll leave it at that. And Bob, let me respond to your question. Um, I think you're absolutely correct. We need to have a broader discussion on strategic stability beyond the U.S.-Russia bilateral framework. And I think there are two ways we can potentially do that. Uh, first, we could use the existing P5 process, which includes the permanent five members of the UN Security Council. Indeed, at the end of the Obama administration, we started a discussion on the future of strategic stability with a seminar that I chaired in New York as Assistant Secretary. Um, I went into that room with very low expectations, and I was pleasantly surprised. Um, Unfortunately, I don't think we have had as robust discussions at the P5 level, but that's one of the recommendations that I would make to this administration. Another alternative is to have a trilateral discussion between the United States, Russia, and China on strategic stability. One of the challenges you face in the P5 um, format is it quickly goes into nonproliferation related issues. If you have the United States, Russia, and China at the table, it's much more a focus on strategic considerations. And let me just also pick up a point that Pranay raised, and that is the link between U.S. allies and um, deterrence and arms control. Uh, I always like to remind this administration is that in many of our allied countries, there's a strong anti-nuclear feeling. And one of the ways that our allies are able to manage that and do what they need to do on nuclear deterrence is having robust arms control uh, and nonproliferation involvement and engagement. And if you don't do that, it really begins to kind of crumble that consensus in many of these allied countries. And for example, you may have seen an article in the Wall Street Journal about maybe three weeks ago how the Social Democratic Party in Germany is starting to question NATO nuclear sharing arrangements. That's not a good thing. So my message uh, to the administration is, I understand that you have concerns about arms control, but understand how you deal with the arms control and non-proliferation issue will have an impact both here domestically in the United States, but also with our allies to build support for nuclear deterrence. So let's take another round of questions. Start here. Right up here in the front, second row. Uh, Frank, you're an elegant moderator. My question is for you. I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlantic Council and the Naval War College. Uh, first, a bias. We should drop the word cyber and use information warfare because cyber is 
too short and too narrow a term. And second, nobody's talked about Britain and France, and I assure you Moscow was worried about them. Yeah. Uh, Frank, tell me why I should not be pessimistic. Uh, in this administration, you have nobody with any real experience in these kinds of issues, the president, the vice president, the secretary of state, secretary of defense, and the new chairman, and a national security advisor who is opposed to arms control. At the same time, you see Russia reducing its budget because it's outflanked us in many systems. And quite frankly, given our nuclear modernization for B-21, Columbia, and ICBMs, that is unaffordable. Nuclear deterrence cost about 6 percent of the budget is now going to be in excess of 10 percent. And this is the last year, barring a crisis, we see budget increases. So we're going to have a huge choice to continue our nuclear deterrence and drop our conventional forces. So we're stuck. You have an administration that's largely opposed to this and a budget which is a Damoclean sword which could lead to structural disarmament. Tell me why I'm wrong and what do we do under those circumstances? Good. Hi, uh, Jeff Price from Johns Hopkins Slice. A couple questions on the premise of the end of the INF regime. One is that our start framework is in many ways premised on the existence of a ban on intermediate range weapons. For instance, the 5,500 kilometer threshold is clearer because it's either countable or it's banned, and that is going to go away. Uh, non strategic weapons you know, are going to be a lot harder to deal with if there's no limit on intermediate range weapons. So that's, that's one question. Um, second is the China argument for withdrawal from the INF Treaty was basically that the cost to our security in freeing Russia from any constraint was outweighed by the benefit to us in freeing us from constraints with respect to China. So I wonder if you could do a balance, and this is probably, uh, well, for anybody who wants it, uh, a question of what are the concrete opportunities military opportunities for us compared to those for Russia uh, with the end of the INF regime. Great. And right there, Ambassador Kennedy. Oh, no, I actually had had my hand up earlier, um, but Frank, you answered the question I was going to ask was, what do people uh, think about the other possibilities um, to deal with these issues? Because I'm also somewhat skeptical about the leadership doing a U.S.-Russia thing. So P5, I think you took on, but um, are there any other fora, uh, such as the P5, that people could see that could mitigate some of these issues mm -hmm. since we have seemed to have such a di difficulty in dealing with things on a U.S.-Russia basis? I mean, multilateral approaches um, in Northeast Asia, some sort of using the old six-party talks to, to deal more broadly with Northeast Asia security. I'm just groping for anything because I, I see such inability, frankly, of our leadership to tackle many of these things, but I hope I'm wrong. Okay, great. We'll come back for one last round of questions. Why don't I turn over to the panelists? Let's start with Amy, then go to Lynn. Ambassador Kennedy just gave me the right to read the first sentence in the Tom Schelling article. Um, I don't think that finding a forum is really the problem. What Tom Schelling said in 1985, arms control has certainly gone off the tracks. For several years, what are called arms negotiations have been mostly a public exchange of accusations. If you look at the U.S. and Russian statements in the CD this week, it's all accusations. So it's less, in my mind, a question of finding a forum <laughs> where we can have discussions than a question of finding the political will to have discussions regardless of the forum. And Part of the problem with that is in the U.S. government, that's relatively cyclical. We are not in a new place. This was 1985, which is the end of the first term of the Reagan administration, and the Reagan administration's arms control proposals in the first term were accusations. In the second term brought us real treaties. So it is somewhat cyclical, but it is not a matter of where, but matter of whether we are willing to have the conversation. So I can't fix that problem. On the question of the dividing line beyond, between INF and New START and what problems that would cause, we have one really specific problem already. Russia tested a ballistic missile to just over 5,500 kilometers to keep it out of INF uh, question. It was the first thing we thought was going to be the noncompliant uh, weapon in INF. 
and to make it count under New START. Now they can, and they did not deploy it, now they can bring it back and deploy it at 5,200 kilometers and not count it under New START. So the absence of a dividing line there will create new risks for our allies in Europe because 5,200 kilometers isn't really an added problem for us. But then one has to ask, why is Russia deploying new types of intermediate range systems that can target Europe and ask about the instabilities and the short time of flight there? So clearly there is a gray area between the two treaties that isn't so much about which treaty do you count things under, but which threats are now being reimagined that were here in the 1980s. Um, on the why not be pessimistic, um, and I know you directed this to Frank, but I can't give you a reason not to be pessimistic. I think everything you said is absolutely true, but you missed one piece of it. And I always go back to the new start hearings when the hearings themselves were not going particularly well. The people were coming up to testify about the wonderful emerging relationship between the new United States and Russia and the reset, and the members' eyes were glazing over. And Admiral Mullen walked in and declared that it had been nine months or seven months at the time, because Old Start expired in December of 2009, and he testified in July of 2010. And he declared it had been seven months since he'd had inspectors on the ground looking at Russian nuclear weapons. And that turned the tide, reminding the members of the committee that we do arms control for national security reasons, not for warm, fuzzy reasons. And I bring that up because Generally, if you're looking within this administration for support for New START, you get it from the military. You get General Hyten and General Selva testifying about the value of transparency, the value of predictability of limits on Russian forces. Whether that's enough to outweigh the either benign neglect or outright opposition to arms control in other quarters of the administration, I can't make predictions. I also worry, be, worry about the value of their support because it started to be caveated in the last couple of weeks with concerns about the new Russian weapons. So you can see an evolving argument coming out in the administration, and it's one that I think Mikhail has made as well, and that others hold true as well, that it's up to Russia to address our concerns with these emerging technologies, and if they don't, it's their fault if New START doesn't get extended. And if that line of reasoning takes hold, then nothing the military says could have an effect. But you do hear different points of view from the military, so if you're looking for anything to hold on to, that would be where it is. Lynn. Um, okay, I'll take. I'll try to take on a couple of these questions. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's hard not to be pessimistic across the board, but I think it's our duty to <laughs> continue to, you know, speak out and offer <laughs> advice to anybody who is or isn't listening about, you know, how to turn things around. And I, I will say there's even um, somehow Amy's escaped this whole panel with very little discussion of Congress and Congress's role. And I think there are a couple, so I'll say a few things. There are a couple things. And obviously, I mean, you know, we have the modernization issue, and you're absolutely right that, you know, I don't think it's a question of no modernization, but there are, you know, as usual, we're um, uh, avoiding hard choices, but the day of reckoning is coming, and there's going to have to be some decisions about, you know, which aspects of modernization are higher, nuclear modernization are, you know, higher priority and which aren't compared to other um, you know, opportunity costs in the defense budget, let alone the overall budget. So that's going to happen. But that also means, you know, I think there is a constituency um, in Congress for not just funding nuclear weapons, but also pursuing an arms control track. And so, uh, and I think there'll be some recognition um, in parts of the administration that, you know, there needs to there are some in Congress who aren't going to be interested in funding an unconstrained arms race, and so they're going to want to see that, you know, where's that component of our overall strategy? So that's one, you know, ray of hope in terms of voices for, you know, I'm, I'm discouraged that everybody is just kind of writing off, you know, that New START won't be extended. I don't believe it because I think allies, um, yeah, I mean, in other words, I don't think the debate's over. I think allies are going to have a voice. I think Congress is going to have a voice. Um, I think there'll be some in the administration. And so I think, you know, I 
I think it's really important to be making the case why it's important for our national security. The other point I'd make about Congress is the po you know the politics of of um, Russia are just all screwed up, as everybody knows, for lots of reasons. You know, Mueller investigation, distrust of uh, of, of our president, dealing with Russia, but uh, Congress on both sides of the aisle really need to create and allow political space for the kind of normal diplomatic and mili military to military engagements that we've been talking about. I mean, you know, there has to, because the risks are really high if we don't allow that to go forward. Um, can I just go to yep. some other questions uh, on, um, I, on START and INF? I, I think, I mean, I think I actually disagree with the um, proposition, whoever said it, that um, the new start was kind of, you know, the ranges are all kind of premise on INF because, you know, well before there was INF, there was SALT, there was um, SALT to start. I, you know, all of this has been premised on a range which has been pretty constant. Um, but I do think if you're, if we're now in an environment where there are intermediate range nuclear capable systems and you want to do, some, quote, do something about it, um, you know, the problem is the will and the interest and where's the overlapping interest, but it, you know, maybe there's been discussion about going to a regime where you're actually... Um, Lynn, we've got about okay, five minutes okay, left. Okay, <laughs> governing, governing all warheads would be one way to go, the new, if you're really just addressing nuclear warheads. Um, I'll stop. Great. Uh, Pranay and Michaela, let me, we've got about five minutes left, so let me turn it to you um, and to either answer the questions or any, f any final remarks. I will give you a reason for optimism, and that's not a position that I'm often in um, as a former Eastern European. But Churchill uh, reportedly said that Americans can be counted on doing the right thing after they've exhausted all the other possibilities. Mm -hmm. So I do hope that as we are facing these very difficult choices that we will do the right thing, and I hope that we will not exhaust that many possibilities because stakes are just too high. On the INF, um, real quick, concre concrete military opportunities. You know, even if we don't see today that we will, we are, we wouldn't be able to deploy INF range missiles today. That doesn't mean that a situation will not arise in the future that makes those deployments possible and that makes allies willing to host INF range missiles. Now, additionally. Even if we do not deploy them, our adversaries or potential adversaries will have to take them into account anyways. And so there might be some utility in those systems, even if today we would not be able to maybe deploy them. Great. Pranay, you have the last word. Well, as it should be, right? Um, <laughs> so I guess reasons for hope. Um, uh, as Lynn referenced, I think Congress is becoming attuned to nuclear issues. Um, they're being forced to do it now, whether it's through new members to Congress, through new staff. I think the NDA process will focus a lot on nuclear issues. Chairman Adam Smith has sort of made, he's planted his flag on nuclear issues um, as far as his approach to the committee process. Um, new START, I think, will be the center of a lot of that discussion because there are going to be ways in which Congress will look to try to incentivize the administration to pursue extension, at least on one side of the aisle. Um, I also think that the presidential primary season has already started, of course, and people have introduced stances on nuclear policy issues very early. That should lead to a discussion about nuclear issues that we have largely been able to avoid, at least at that level, for some time. Um, and I think that there, there should be a goal here, which is reinvigorating uh, a relatively neutral debate on arms control as opposed to a politicized one. And maybe that is what we're going to see happen um, with the congressional process and with the primary season going. Um, another reason is that New START is still in, defor still in force right now. Um, uniform military seems behind it, as Amy has said. Um, given that it's still in force, given that it provides a basis upon which to discuss these issues tied to a treaty in Congress and in the primary season, I think that's a good thing. Um, quickly on the INF question, uh, I'm worried that where the administration ends up on a position for New START extension is that unless non-strategic nuclear weapons are constrained, we will not pursue extension of the treaty. Uh, I think there's a little bit of hypocrisy to that 
position, given that the one treaty which seemed to govern some of the delivery systems that were that would be used to deliver non-strategic nuclear weapons was the INF Treaty, and we just withdrew from that and suspended our obligations under it. So we're sort of creating the space underneath the 55-kilometer threshold for all countries to build these weapons, including Russia and other countries that were waiting to see what the United States and Russia do in that space to develop their own systems. So um, my hope is that they come to some sort of conclusion, whether it's in the debate over New START extension or strategic stability talks in the future to try to find a way to limit this space again. And maybe it's just additional transparency and regionalization or um, a high ceiling, but there has to be some way to talk about uh, what comes after INF. Well, thanks so much to all the panelists. I thought this was a great discussion. Uh, we didn't spend our time fighting about INF, but we looked to the future. And I think Every panelist provided some very useful ideas about how we manage this very, very complicated strategic environment. So please join me in thanking the panelists. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.